So welcome everyone to the second of the SBTS and TBTS 2016 webinars. Uh, my name's Katrina and I'm a technical officer at Southern Beef Technology Services and I'm going to be facilitating tonight's webinar. So Alex McDonald, who's our manager at SBTS and TBTS, will be presenting tonight's webinar. And he has changed the title of the webinar slightly. So it's now called Getting It Right, Contemporary Groups and Genetic Linkage. But we'll also be covering management groups tonight. So just before we get started, a few house housekeeping items. So if your questions box disappears, you can click on the red arrow up the top here to get it back. And if you want to ask the presenter a question, you can simply type your question into the questions page, uh, pane and then press send. Um, Alex will be stopping a couple of times throughout this presentation for questions. And if you're having audio problems, you can call in using your telephone by switching your audio from mic and speakers to telephone and then dial in the number using the number provided. So with that, we're going to hand over to Alex for tonight's webinar. Okay, good evening everyone. Um, this is the second, this is, this, hang on, just getting my, Okay, sorry that, just getting the technology right. So good evening everyone. Um, this is the second uh, of a series of six webinars. Uh, this one is more at the basic level of just getting contemporary groups and genetic linkage right. Um, and you'll see from the slide in front of you now, there's uh, four more uh, webinars to come um, and uh, we'd encourage you to uh, watch the whole series. So, the web, this webinar is about maximising the value of data submitted to BreedPlan. Um, sometimes we hear people say, well, BreedPlan's not working for my herd or BreedPlan's not telling me uh, what I see with my eyes. And invariably, uh, there's two causes of this. Um, one will be uh, to do with contemporary group size and the other one will be uh, to do with genetic linkage. And we're going to address both those issues in detail tonight. So how to optimise the size of contemporary groups, analysing breed plan, how to generate genetic linkage. So first of all, some definitions. <clears throat> first of all, a management group is a group of animals directly comparable due to on-farm management decisions. In other words, which animals do you run together in, in comparable mobs, etc. Then we use the term contemporary group, which is the group of animals directly compared for each trait in the breed plan analysis. Now, they're not the same thing because breed plan does impose uh, some further breaking up of a management group into contemporary groups, and we'll talk about that. Genetic linkage is common genetics used across contemporary groups within a herd. In other words, within your herd um, are those uh, contemporary groups uh, linked with common genetics, be that usually through AI size or common size. And also the same uh, term applies to common genetics used across herds, which is allow, allows us to uh, compare herds directly. So when we're calculating an EBV, uh, what we're targeting is uh, the genetic component um, of what an animal looks like and we're trying to eliminate the, what we call the environmental effects. In other words, differences in nutrition, uh, difference in treatment, etc. So if, if you can accept we're targeting uh, the genetic component um, and I'll show you how we try to eliminate the environmental uh, effects. So environmental effects are minimised by 
only directly comparing animals that have had an equal opportunity to conform to perform, i.e. within a contemporary group. So clearly, if they're running in quite different conditions, they're running in quite different properties, then we don't, we never, or breed plan never directly compares those animals. Now, as I said, a management group is what happens on your property. Uh, a contemporary group is actually f further uh, uh, managed by the breed plan analysis. And so the, the simple, uh, um, conditions that breed plan imposes are first of all that um, the animals are bred in the same herd or reared in the same herd, uh, they're in the same calving year, they're the same sex. So for example, bulls and heifers are never directly compared because that wouldn't be fair. Uh, ETs are never compared directly with natural calves, uh, ET calves are compared with other ETs and of course natural joinings and, and AIs are compared with each other. Twins are never compared directly with singles because that wouldn't be fair either to, to get, expect a twin to perform anywhere near uh, what a single can do reared on their own dam. And then uh, breed plan imposes what we call age slicing. So uh, in other words, your late born calves are never directly compared with your early born calves and so on and we'll talk a bit more about that. And for um, birth traits, uh, dam age is also imposed in terms of first carvers or the progeny of first carvers, performance of first carvers are never directly compared with mature cows. Um, some, some other automatic uh, um, rules that are imposed are clearly animals have to be of the same breed to be compared or the same group of crossbreeds can be compared in some analyses and Animals are only ever compared if they're for weights in any way if they are weighed on the same date. So if we get a group of animals weighed on a different date, uh, then they are treated as a separate contemporary group. Um, whoops, let's just go back up. Um, then we have what we call breeder defined management groups uh, at birth and then post birth. And that's really about where animals have been treated differently uh, and the breeder defines that when they submit the data. They say this is group one and this is group two. So just to look at this a little bit uh, um, graphically, aid slicing for 200 day weights is on 45 day periods and the 45 day period is calculated from the, the date that the first calf is born, it counts 45 days and then all calves within that 45 days are compared directly. Then uh, it looks for the next calf born, which in this case is uh, 20th of February, and then it counts 45 days and creates uh, a second contemporary group. 400 day weights have a slightly larger age slicing. Um, they are sliced into 60 day groups. Uh, so start with the first calf, count 60 days in first contemporary group, look for the next calf. Now, it's important to understand these are imposed by the analysis. You don't have to think about this when you're submitting the data, but just to let you know that the breed plan analysis does, uh, um, in an effort to eliminate changes in or differences in environment, uh, limits the period of, of uh, birth dates that it will compare calves. So uh, I talked about 200 day wait at 45 days, birth weight's the same. Um, birth weights are compared in the first, uh, with calves born in the first 45 days directly and then calves born in the next 45 days and that's clearly because seasonal conditions can change quite a lot over a calving period. 200 day wait is 45 days, 400 day wait is 60 days, 600 day wait is 60 days, Scrotal size is 60 days, scan traits are 60 days. Now, let's just talk a little bit about breeder defined management groups. Um, you must provide management groups for those animals that have been treated differently to their peers. For example, uh, if 
two groups of calves, even though they may be born on the same property, born at the same time of year, born in the same 45 days, if for some reason some of those calves have been put on feed, uh, for example, to go to show, uh, and the others are left at pasture, then it's very important that you tell breed plan that those calves are being treated differently and so can't be directly compared. Uh, sickness or injury, if a calf gets crook or um, gets injured, then clearly it's uh, going to affect its performance and so that should be subgrouped into a separate management group as well. Show animals we talked about, if they've, if they've been fed differently, then they need to be uh, contemporary groups differently. Uh, and another example is where um, breeders use yearling bulls for mating. Uh, those bulls could be going out sometime after their 400 day wait. Clearly it wouldn't be fair to compare the bulls that have been used uh, for mating or joining um, with those that have, haven't been used for mating at their 600 day wait. So after 400 day wait then any bulls, yearling bulls used for mating need to be uh, def defined as a separate management group. So I'm going to give you an example of uh, what happens uh, combined in the combined effect of age slicing and the combined effect of, of breeder-defined management groups. So here's a group of weaners weighed on the same day. Uh, the first thing that automatically happens is that females go into one group, entire males into another, and if some calves have been castrated, uh, um, before they're weighed, then they go into a steer group. Uh, this is a breeder imposed management groups. Um, you've told us some of them have gone into a show team, been fed differently. Um, you've also told us that the calves that were reared in paddock A uh, were quite differently treated or the, the nutrition was significantly different between paddock A and paddock B. Uh, even though, again, they're on the same property, they, they could well be subgrouped differently if you think the paddock conditions could affect their, their performance. And, of course, as we said, sick animals. Uh, and then breed plan steps back in again and says, well, we're going to slice on age. Uh, we'll have a first foot normally for 200 day wait, 45 days, second slice 45 days, and if they're still carving after that, there would be a, a third or fourth uh, 45 day slice. So in practice, what can happen uh, for 40 weaners weighed on the same day, most likely come out of the same paddock, 20 females will go into one group. Uh, if there had been some castration done um, before the 200 day wait, there, would, there may be 10 left as bulls and 10 as steers, so there's three separate groups already. Um, if you, if you looked at the entire males, uh, they could be broken up again, uh, two into a show team, four, into paddock, four from paddock A, three from paddock B and one sick. And you can see our contemporary groups, for, certainly for the entire males, uh, are getting quite small. Um, in paddock A, uh, once we do an age slice, we're down to two in slice one, one in slice two, and one in slice three. So what that's saying is that um, uh, even though you may weigh 40 weaners on the, on the same day, a combination of breed, plans, breed plan contemporary grouping and uh, uh, breeder management groups can end up with very small contemporary groups, in this case uh, for entire males. Now, here's an example of what we would prefer to see happen with those same 40 weaners weighed on the same day. First of all, we would hope that none of the males are castrated at least until there's a 200 day wait. So we now just have the two groups, 20 females and 20 entire males. Let's look at the males again. None in the show team. Uh, the entire males all came out of the same paddock, paddock A one of them was crook, so it's subgrouped out. And then we step in with our age slicing, and what we've got here now is 10 in age slice one, first 45 days, seven in age slice two, 
uh, second 45 days and two uh, in two late carvers. So uh, as I'll show you, those first two contemporary groups are, are really good sized contemporary groups. Um, the two in age slice three is still a useful contemporary group, but nowhere near as useful as the first two. So that's the preferred situation we would like uh, to see breeders manage in terms of trying to keep their contemporary groups as large as possible. So uh, there's a large, when we talk about contemporary group size, um, there's a few rules or few rules of thumb. Uh, there's a large increase in value of additional animals in a temporary group of one to five animals where more than one size is represented. So uh, certainly try and get your contemporary groups much bigger than one and, and hopefully bigger than five. Uh, optimal is, to, is a group of six and above. Uh, and once a ten, contemporary group size of 10 animals are re is reached, um, the adding additional animals doesn't have a great deal of advantage and I'll show you uh, that in a graphic form just in a moment right there. So this is a, um, exactly what I was talking about. Um, what it's saying is that uh, a contemporary group of one is, is, is really not a contemporary group because there's nothing to compare that one calf with. Um, a, con a contemporary group of two is a lot better than a contemporary group of one and so on, so on up uh, until we get up here to a contemporary group of six, uh, which, is, which is getting a, an effectiveness of 0.8, um, effective progeny. Um, and as you can see, once we get to 10, there's very little increase in the, in the effective progeny uh, size uh, of the contemporary group. So if you've got contemporary groups in the range six to 10, then that's, that's really good. And if you've got a, a nice uh, tight carving period, um, you can achieve that with a, with, even with a moderate sized or even a, 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 a not so large herd. So to maximise, as I've said, if your carving is nice and restricted, six to eight weeks would be perfect. Um, but if we talk about uh, 45 day periods, that's six and a half weeks. So even if you carved over 12 weeks, you're still going to get all calves into two contemporary groups. Um, animals which are in, which have been reared together and should be compared must be weighed on the same day. Uh, I think that would normally happen, but uh, in an extreme case, you wouldn't get through weighing half the calves uh, one day, leaving the rest in the yards overnight and, and then weighing the rest of them the second day. Um, if you did that, it wouldn't be fair to compare them and so therefore breed plan would automatically uh, put them into two groups. So only animals which are weighed on the same day will be compared. Uh, wherever you're going to split a group, uh, for example, uh, some male calves are going to be castrated. Um, always try and get a weight before you split the group. So in this case, uh, for 200 day weight, if you wanted to castrate some calves at, let's say, 150 days, then you should weigh them at that 150 days before you castrate any calves. Uh, same if you're pulling a show team out, try and get or ensure that you get a weight before your show team comes out. Now, hopefully that would be uh, um, after 200 day weights, but it, even better if it didn't occur till after 400 day weights. Uh, and of course, same applies when you're going to use yearling bulls. Make sure you get a weight on the whole group of bulls before you send those yearling bulls out to do their work. Now, if you do need to split animals, try to use the automatic grouping. So. Uh, a simple example is if you're going to split uh, a mob of cows and calves, um, ideally you would split them uh, on sex, so all the cows with bull calves would go into one paddock and all, all the cows with heifer calves into another paddock, which is a pretty logical thing to do anyway. Um, same with age of calf. Uh, if you've got a, a tight calving group, or you know, minimum, maximum 12-week calving, then it's not really a big issue. But if you had to split a mob 
ideally it's split the calves born in the first 45 days off into one group and, and the second 45 days into another group. Um, ET calves, if you do have ET calves, try and keep all your ET calves together in a contemporary group um, and same for non-ET calves and in a case where uh, let's say you had two groups at 200 day weight then try your very hardest to make sure that you don't split again, that you try and at least keep those same groups together for when you come to a 400 or a 600 day weight. Um, for the analysis of ET calves, it's advantageous if all the recipients are of the same breed or more than advantageous, the calves will only be compared with each other if their uh, dams or their recipient dams are the same breed. So it's, it wouldn't be fair to compare the, uh, a calf that had a Frisian cow uh, recip with a calf that had a maybe a, a British breed uh, recip and run animals in as large a group as possible. Um, within a contemporary group, Breed plan does some adjustments. Uh, it adjusts for age. So even though uh, a group born over 45 days are compared directly with each other, um, their weights are adjusted so that the firstborn calves don't get an advantage over the later-born calves. So um, there is an age of adjustment uh, within contemporary groups. Um, and same with age of dam. Uh, the the peak dam production is considered to be about five years of age and so three, the, the progeny of three and four year old cows are adjusted up a little bit, a dam age adjustment um, and so on for much older cows as well. So there's some adjustment goes on there. Again, nothing you have to worry about um, because breed plan does that automatically. Now we're just going to break there um, and I'm just going to ask Katrina if there are any questions that have come in. Um, not yet, but if anyone's got any questions at the moment, they can type them into the box now. Okay, well, we can handle questions later um, if you have them. So I'll press on uh, to the second part of this. We've just Go had on. one come in, Alex. So... Yep. What's the best way to introduce purchased animals into a contemporary group? Uh, the simple answer is that if they're purchased, they will be treated as a separate contemporary group because they've been born in a different herd. Um, you could argue that uh, if they were sort of week old or month old calves when they're introduced, then they, maybe they should be in the same contemporary group. but. Um, the safety first approach of breed plan is that if they're born on a different property, they will be analysed in a different contemporary group. And just a follow up is that's for their entire life. That's correct. Yep. Um, and we've had another one. Uh, multi sires against single sire comparisons. Um, we're going to go uh, on to that. Um, but the, the simple answer is that uh, if you have a contemporary group with only one sire, then uh, the EBVs of the calves, the calves will be compared, but we don't get any useful information on how that sire ranks against other sires in the herd. So it's always advisable to have more than one sire represented in a contemporary group. Thanks, Alex. There's no more questions at the moment. Okay, we'll, we'll press on. So uh, let's talk about genetic linkage. And just as an introduction, um, breed plan is very careful only to compare calves with other contemporary calves which have been treated the same. So for it to compare groups of calves, born on the same property but in different contemporary groups, or if it's to compare animals born on different properties, then it's critical that we have what we call genetic linkage, and that is common genetics across those groups. 
Um, it can be across herds and it also can be across countries uh, where we're doing multi-country breed plan analysis. So this is a little exercise on showing you how breed plan is able to compare sires in different herds in different contemporary groups by using a, a common link sire. So in this case, uh, a bit of raw data, sire A's uh, progeny averaged about 300 kilos at 400 days of age. Sire B's calves averaged about 370 kilos. Sire C's uh, calves averaged about 330 kilos. But their sire A and sire C are certainly on different properties. Um, sire, sire B, the red sire, we'll just have a look at how he becomes the, the link sire. Sorry, I'm, I'll correct that. Sire, B, sire A, sire B and sire C are all on different properties or in different contemporary groups, whichever way we look at it. Now, where we have a common benchmark sire, in this case it's a bull called Admiral, uh, that allows us to be able to compare sire A, sire B and sire C. So if we compare the progeny of sire A with the, with the benchmark sire Admiral, you'll see that sire A's, uh, the weight of his progeny was on average about five kilos heavier than the progeny of, of Admiral. Sire B's progeny were on average about five kilos less than the benchmark sire, Admiral, and sire C's calves averaged about 15 kilos better than Admiral. So suddenly you can see that by using Admiral Admiral as the benchmark sire, even though if we go if we go back, you can see that sire B's progeny were um, significantly heavier than sire C. In fact, when we use a benchmark sire, it shows that sire C's uh, calves were superior to sire B by using the benchmarking sire. So to put that into numbers, uh, as I've just said, sire A was five, progeny were five kilos heavier than the benchmark. Sire B's were five kilos lighter. This is their raw weights, adjusted weights. And sire C's were 10 kilos heavier than the benchmark sire. So in, in a very simplistic way, if, if Admiral uh, had an EBV of zero, then uh, in a simplistic way, that would tell us that sire A uh, is plus 10 kilos EBV. Now, you'll see that although his progeny were only five kilos heavier than, than Admiral, um, because sire A only contributed half the genetics, the other half came from the cows, then, then half of his, uh, or his total superiority is twice the difference in the weight of his calves. So he's a plus 10. Sire B, by the same logic, is a minus 10. And sire C, using the same logic, is a plus 20. So there we've uh, given an example of um, uh, how genetic linkage allows us to compare animals in different contemporary groups, be they on the same property or different properties or even technically different countries. So how do we maximise linkage within a herd? Um, one good way to do that is to use uh, common AI sires. Uh, it says across herds here, and that that applies as well. But where you've got uh, a number of contemporary groups or uh, a group of three different herds of 50 cows run under different conditions, um, a very useful way of getting a benchmark or a, or a link sire is to use the same AI sire in those three herds. And the other way, which is um, uh, very desirable but not always practical uh, in the extreme is that by mixing up your cows, your cow calving groups at weaning, uh, you actually create uh, a lot of genetic linkage 
across that next group of calves when they're born. I'll explain that in a little bit more detail. We've got mob A, 40 cows simply joined to, natural joined to sire A. Mob B, we've got 40 cows joined to sire B. If at weaning we just mix these mobs up randomly or split them, uh, split them in half and regroup them, we would end up with uh, mob A for the next set of calves having 20 cows joined to, to sire A and 20 cows joined to sire B and the same in mob B, 20 cows and 20 cows. Now, that's a sort of a, a perfect situation and, and may not suit people's management, but if at least some of the cows from mob A can be switched into mob B and vice versa, um, that goes from having two contemporary groups with single size in them to, to two useful contemporary groups which have got at least two, two sizes represented. So here's another example uh, of, of, of the advantage of changing your calving groups when you wean, last, wean the first group of calves. Same thing, 40 cows. Uh, this time we've used an AI sire in mob A called sire A, uh, an AI sire in mob B called AI sire C, and then we've used a sire B in the backup and sire D. So we've got four sires. Um, if, if you didn't do any mixing at all, you would at least have two sires represented in each group. But an even better uh, uh, or a more desirable outcome in terms of getting good contemporary groups or good genetic linkage, assuming a 50% AI success rate, would be again to mix um, uh, half the cows from each group uh, into uh, across mobs. So in mob A, we've now got 20 cows joined to sire A. Sorry, I've jumped ahead. Without mixing, we've got 20 cows in mob A joined to sire A. 20 cows joined to sire B, the follow-up sire, same in mob B. Half the cows joined to, to the AI sire, half to the, um, the follow-up sire. Now, if you did actually mix these mobs, again, in the perfect world, you actually split them half and half, you would then, for the next carving, have mob A with 10 cows joined each to Sire A and Sire B, the AI sires, and then, sorry, Sire A and Sire C, the AI sires, and then um, 10 cows each joined to the natural follow-up bulls. So that's a sort of perfect situation. Probably won't work in most situations in the perfect way, but it does demonstrate uh, what's, what will certainly help get more sires represented in each contemporary group. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about genetic linkage um, across herds. Um, this is uh, an example of uh, actually some, some Brahmin bulls, for those of you who may know some of those prefixes. Uh, these are four different herds. Lancefield, M, Elrose, Kaiwara and Lanes Creek. Now, um, What's happened here is that the linkage has occurred in, in several different ways. The linkage between Lansfield M and Elrose has actually been provided by an AI sire called J Data Pack. So his, that sire, Data Pack, has benchmarked Elrose against Lansfield M. Now they've used, each used Mr. International and, sorry, uh, Lansfield have used Mr. International, Elrose have used uh, L Ambition. Now, what you can see here is that uh, although uh, Data Pack has linked those two herds, the Bull Ambition has now linked Elrose and Lanes Creek as a benchmark sire. And then the same again, Mr. International has actually gone across three different herds, Lansfield M, Kaiwara and Lanes Creek. So in that joining, in, sorry, in that year, uh, by just using 
common size, usually they'll be AI size, uh, across different herds can provide very strong linkage be between a whole group of herds. And when we do a, a, a breed genetic evaluation, breed plan analysis, um, we rely on linkage that occurs not in one year but over a whole number of years. Um, which allows us to benchmark or take out the environmental effects uh, of different conditions that herds are run under. So um, it's important to main genetic comparisons within contemporary groups. Uh, a question which we've really um, almost covered but uh, what will happen if there is only one calf in a contemporary group? Where there's one calf in a contemporary group, there's nothing we can compare that calf with. So in fact, what will happen, he will simply get what we call mid-parent EBVs. He'll get the average EBVs of his parents. So it doesn't mean he drops out of breed plan, it doesn't mean he doesn't get, doesn't get his EBVs, but no matter how good or bad the calf is, he's going to get um, the average of his parents' EBVs. So single animal management groups are quite undesirable and would be a classic case where a uh, breed plan would be seen not to be working because uh, you know this could be the biggest heaviest calf in the mob but there's nothing that can be it can be compared with so he's not going to get credit for that. What will occur if there is only progeny from one sire represented in a contemporary group? Um, We've already covered that. That is that the calves are compared. Uh, the dams will get credit for the best calves and not so much credit for the, the lower, the not so well performing calves. But as far as the sire is concerned, there's nothing we can benchmark that sire, sire against. So uh, a sire in a single, sorry, a contemporary group with a single sire will add no information, no additional information to the EBVs of that sire. And hence, uh, as we've just discussed, the need to make sure that in every contemporary group, if possible, there is more than one sire represented. So breeder defined management groups, uh, things that should be defined, as we've talked about, yearling bulls that are joined, submissive bulls. Um, this is just a case where there's bullying in, within the bull mob and one or more bulls gets uh, bullied um, excessively and clearly doesn't perform to his potential, he should be subgrouped out into a separate mat or he or they should be subgrouped into a, uh, a different um, contemporary group and calves off feed for different periods before weighing well. That's pretty much taken care of by different weight, by animals only being compared on the same weigh day. So what happens if animals are not correctly assigned management groups? Well. I think it should be pretty obvious that, uh, for example, if we used uh, if we used the yearling bull example, um, the bulls that were joined, if they were not subgrouped out, uh, would be at a great disadvantage compared to the bulls that were not joined in that particular year. So what will happen is that uh, the bulls that were that were used for joining will be disadvantaged severely because they are. Uh, seen not to be or, or don't don't weigh anywhere near as heavy as the bulls that have been not been joined and likewise the bulls that have been left in the paddock and haven't been used for mating uh, get an advantage because they're going to be a bit heavier than, than the average. So uh, if you don't subgroup properly or, or assign management groups then breed plan effectively won't get it right. It can't get it right because it's not being given the information it needs. Uh, same with uh, submissive bulls or sick or injured animals. Um, if, if you don't tell breed plan that they that they are at a disadvantage or an advantage, then it can't possibly get it right. So a bit of a, a summary about the importance uh, of accurate information. Uh, clearly, it seems basic, but breed plan does rely on accurate information on sires and dams. Uh, if you don't have sires and dams correctly then 
really it's it's impossible for a breed plan to get it right. Now, if it were just you know one calf that was incorrectly sired out of 20, then it's probably not going to do a bad job. Um, but if it's uh, if there's a, a lot of incorrect pair or significant amount of incorrect parentage, then it's not going to work. Uh, accurate birth dates again should be a given, but uh, when breed plan adjusts for age, uh, then it must have accurate birth dates or it won't get that adjustment right. Um, we talked about recipient dams um, should be of the same breed and ideally of similar age, although we can do some adjustment for age of a recipient dam. And where sires, uh, follow-up sires are introduced soon after an AI program, or at least before the before the next cycle, um, it's not. There will be overlap between the the birth dates of the AI calves and the birth dates of the, or there can be overlap between the birth dates of the AI calves and the birth dates of the um, progeny of the follow-up sire. So if at all in doubt, make sure you do DNA parentage to check just exactly which sire those doubtful calves are by. Um, and we've talked about accurate contemporary grouping. So just again, uh, if I could just repeat what I said um, at the start that Replan sometimes gets criticised of not getting it right um, and in fact it won't get it right if it doesn't get good quality data. So quality data equals quality EBVs, poor data equals poor quality EBVs um, and quite a significant part of that depends on uh, breeder defined management groups um, <clears throat> and it also depends on good linkage, genetic linkage um, between groups and between herds. Um, just before we go there, um, do we have any questions, Katrina? Yep, so we've had one come in so far and if anyone else has got any, type them into your box now. So the first one is, what happens if calf sire is corrected later, e.g. when a bull is parent parified and found to be incorrect? Does breed plan retrospectively use this correct information? A uh, simple answer is yes. Um, each time a breed plan analysis is done, it analyzes the whole data set. Um, it doesn't have a memory. Uh, so if a sire has been changed from one run to the next, then the new analysis will use a correct sire. And another question, is there any benefit to doing multiple weights for a contemporary group during a certain weight period, i.e. two times recorded weights for 200 day weight? Uh, answers yes again. Um, two weights will always be better for a particular trait, 200 day weight, two weights will always be better than one um, just because it helps take out some of those random effects about, you know, just whether the calf went through first in the group or last in the group and whether it's um, maybe had a drink of water or something like that. So yes, two weights are always better and just um, so you're aware, uh, you can weigh a group of calves at any time. Breed plan will decide whether that's a 200 day weight, a 400 day weight or a 600 day weight from the average age of those calves. So in general terms, a weight taken between 100 and 300 days average age will be uh, considered a 200 day weight. So if you weighed your calves, uh, uh, let's say you, you weaned it right on 200 days and you weighed them uh, uh, and then, well that's not a good example because we're trying to pick, pick up um, milk. If you're going to weigh two 200 day weights where we're getting uh, an estimate of milk production of the dam, you could weigh them at say 170 days and 200 days. Um, if uh, we talked about a 400 day weight, anything between 300 and 500 is considered a 400 day weight. So sure, uh, a weight at 370 and another weight at 430 days is actually going to be advantageous compared to a single weight at 400 days. Thanks, Alex. We've had uh, another question. Um, are there contemporary groups for docility scoring? 
Yes, um, and they are much broader from memory. I think they are actually um, six-month contemporary groups. Uh, um, and the reason for that, and of course they would have to be scored on the same day, uh, but in effect it's saying that that temperament is uh, to a large degree innate. Uh, so whether you so you can compare the temper, temperament of an animal at 200 days of age with say an animal that's 300 or 350 days of age, um, provided you they were all treated the same prior to scoring. Um, but yes, a much wider range. Uh, another question, should weighings be curfewed for time off water? No, they don't need to be curfewed. Uh, the only critical thing is that, that all animals have basically the same curfew. So. In other words, if you if you bring a mob in and they stand around in the yards for a couple of hours and then you weigh them all, that's fine. Um, but there's no need to to hold them overnight or anything like that. It's it's about treating like with like. So if they've all been off feed for two hundred at two for two hours or, or two hours and a bit by the time you get them weighed, um, then that's fine. If you do happen to bring them all in and, and you don't get uh, of an evening and you don't get to weigh them till the next morning, that's fine too because they've all been curfewed for the same time. But there's no need to deliberately curfew. So there's no more questions at the moment. So um, if you finish the presentation, Alex, and if anyone else has got any more questions, they can type them in and we can answer them at the end. Okay. So um, for further information, you'll see the slide um, after each webinar, but um, there's four people involved in SBTS and TBTS uh, and we each have uh, allocated breeds. I look after Limousin and Simmental. Katrina looks after quite a bunch of uh, breeds, um, as you can see there, and Paul Williams looks after the tropical breeds in the north of Australia, and Carl Tesling looks after Wagyu. Um, Carl's the technical officer of Wagyu, so any questions on Wagyu uh, need to go to Carl. So, uh, as I said at the start, there are four more s webinars to come. Uh, making Breed Plan Work For You, Performance Recording Problems. It will be on the 10th of October. I think next Monday is a holiday weekend. Uh, webinar 4, Fertility Matters, Recording Fertility with Breed Plan. 5, Collecting Abattoir Carcass Information. And webinar 6, Where To With Genomics. So we encourage you to, uh, to join us for um, those additional webinars. So a final chance to... Um, Ask any questions, Katrina? Have any more questions come in? Uh, no. Okay. All right. All good. So just while we're waiting to see if there is any more questions, um, there will be a poll that will pop up after we close the webinar. So if everyone could take a couple of minutes to fill that out for us, we'd really appreciate it. Um, the webinar has been recorded and will be made available. Who was unable to attend or would like a copy, it will go up on the SBTS and TBTS YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, and you can access answers to any of your unanswered questions by contacting the technical officer for your breed, which Alex showed just before. So it looks like there's no more questions, so we might end the webinar there for tonight. Thank you everyone for hopping on and if you do think of some questions afterwards, you can contact um, staff at SBTS and TBTS and we'll follow those up for you. All right, good night everyone. Don't forget the poll.